Hi there! We're going to talk a little bit about the history of Euclidean geometry and how it transitioned into being non-Euclidean geometry. So the first thing that we need to look at are Euclid's postulates. These are sort of the ground rules of Euclidean geometry. So this first postulate is saying that if we have a pair of points, then there's a line segment that connects them, right? A straight line that connects a pair of points, and that this should be unique. Okay, so there's nothing too radical about this first postulate. Okay, now the second postulate says that given such a line segment, we can extend it indefinitely to form a straight line of any length. Again, this corresponds to our usual intuitions for the plane. This seems all pretty reasonable. Okay, the third postulate is saying that if we pick a point and a radius, then there should be a circle about that point of that radius. Right, so we can have one circle of any given radius and this should be unique. Okay, the fourth postulate is saying that all right angles are congruent to each other. Right, so if we make a right angle here, it should be congruent to a right angle over here. Right, there should be some way of transitioning from one right angle to another, and the angle should be preserved. Okay, so this is sort of saying that there's a coherent definition of angle that applies at all places. Okay, so these are the first four postulates. Now let's have a look at the fifth. Right, when we look at Euclid's fifth postulate, we see a much more complicated statement. If a straight line falling on two straight lines makes the interior angles on the same side less than two right angles, the two straight lines, if extended indefinitely, meet on that side on which the angles are less than two right angles. Ooh. There's a lot going on in this statement. Clearly, Euclid's fifth postulate is sort of more sophisticated than the other four, right? This is saying a lot more than the other four postulates were saying. So let's have a look at this. We have two straight lines falling on this segment here. They make two angles, alpha and beta, and if the sum of those angles is less than two right angles, or less than pi, then, well, what happens? Right, what happens in this blue cloud? It's not entirely clear. Our physical intuition says that they should meet somewhere, but that physical intuition needs to be encoded into a, a postulate, uh, and Euclid noticed that this is a very special postulate, a very special property of the plane that needed to be included in the set of axioms. And as soon as uh, Euclid did this, people noticed that there was something up with the fifth postulate, that it was somehow special. Okay, so they started to look for statements that were equivalent to it and perhaps more obvious. So here are several statements equivalent to the fifth postulate. Proclus in 400 said, a line intersecting one of two parallel lines intersects the other. So if we have a pair of parallel lines, and we have a line that intersects one of them, that it must, at some point, intersect the other parallel line. Right? Again, this agrees with our intuitions about space, uh, and it turns out that this statement is equivalent to the fifth postulate. Uh, here's a equivalent statement from the Arabic tradition, from Nasiraddin in 1400. 
Uh, the fourth angle of a quadrilateral with three right angles is also a right angle. So if we have a quadrilateral and we have three right angles, then this fourth angle here must also be a right angle. Okay, so if that so was somehow hidden from us, then that last angle of the quadrilateral must also be a right angle. Okay, again, this agrees with our intuitions about space. Uh, here's a statement from the English tradition, John Wallace, who was a tutor to Sir Isaac Newton. Um, to every triangle, there is a similar triangle of any given size. So if we have a small triangle, we can enlarge it and obtain a similar triangle of any given size that we want. Okay, It's not clear how this relates to the theory of parallels, but it turns out that this is in fact equivalent to the parallel postulate. Uh, I've highlighted this axiom due to John Playfair because this is often used in high school geometry textbooks. So this says if we have a straight line L and a point not on L, then there is a unique line passing through P parallel to L. Okay, so this is a fairly common equivalent to the fifth postulate uh, that you might have seen in high school and which we'll explore throughout this course. Okay, here's another um, equivalent, this time due to Legendre, so in the French mathematical tradition, which says the sum of angles in a triangle is equal to pi. Okay, so all of these statements are equivalent to Euclid's fifth postulate. Um, and they suggest that if Euclid's postulate is false, then something very interesting is going to happen in our geometry. Let's take uh, Legendre's example. So here we know that the angles sum up to pi. But if we deny or reject uh, this statement, then we could have triangles where, say, the angles add up to one-tenth, right? We could have very small angles uh, and yet still be a triangle. Very odd statement, but it's possible, okay? Or uh, if we deny Proclus is equivalent, then we might have two parallel lines, a line meeting one, but somehow avoids the other. That'd be very strange. But if we deny the validity of Euclid's fifth postulate, then these kinds of things will happen in our geometry. Right? So rejecting these hints to strange and alien geometry. And we're going to look into that uh, in this course. Okay, so I want to say a little bit about the main players um, who really kind of unlocked uh, the existence of hyperbolic geometry. Uh, one's Karl Friedrich Gauss, uh, Nikolai Ivanovich Lobachevsky, Farkash Bayai, and Janosch Bayai. So uh, Gauss uh, is well known to the mathematical community, did uh, lots and lots of innovative work in number theory, and uh, as a teenager investigated the theory of parallels, and was uh, convinced that we can deny the fifth postulate and still obtain a consistent geometry. Now Gauss was known to only publish things that he thought were polished, that he thought were finished works, uh, so he was very hesitant to publish his work on uh, the parallel postulate. Um, Lobachevsky was in uh, Russia, in particular in Kazan, okay, was also working on the theory of parallels and uh, developed an extensive geometry where uh, you deny the fifth postulate and you still get sort of reasonable geometric statements, uh, but was working independently of Gauss. Um, Farkash Boyai, uh, working in Hungary, uh, was the father of Janos Boyai, 
and had the following words to say to his son. You must not attempt this approach to parallels. I know this way to the very end. I have traversed this bottomless night, which extinguished all light and joy in my life. I entreat you, leave the science of parallels alone. Learn from my example. Okay. Strong words from a father to his son. Uh, this was written in 1820, when Janos was a teenager, about 18 years old, and had been working on the theory of parallels, much like his father had. So I encourage you to look into uh, these four characters and their interactions. It's one of the great dramatic moments in the history of mathematics. Uh, and you can see the depth of emotion that uh, Farkash is conveying to Janos in uh, his letter of 1820. Okay, So let's have a look at what happens when we deny uh, one of the equivalents of Euclid's fifth postulate. So we're going to reject Playfair's axiom. Okay, so if we reject Playfair's axiom, then given a line L and a point not on L, there exist two parallel lines to L passing through the point P. Okay, so let's see what that could look like. Uh, we're going to introduce uh, a particular model of non-Euclidean geometry. We're going to call this our first disk model. Okay, uh, so this is a, a model of geometry, a, a, a sort of an example of a geometry. Uh, its points are going to be points in the open disk. Okay, so the, the set that consists of this model is going to be uh, all the points in the open disk, which is why we have this dashed line uh, at the boundary, and its lines are going to be lines that are subsets of that open disk again. So if at any point you find yourself traveling back in time to the uh, late 18th, early 19th century, uh, this would be a very good example to bring with you. This is an example that says it is possible to have a consistent geometry where Euclid's fifth postulate fails. So if you're able to remember this example and you find yourself uh, in uh, 1805, uh, you could very much impress the mathematical community with this example. So how does it work? Uh, we have lines and points, and we're going to come up with uh, an example that says Euclid's fifth postulate does not hold. So what do we do? We take a line L, we take a point P, we construct one parallel line, uh, so these two are parallel, very good, and we can construct additional parallel lines through P that are parallel to L. Okay, so this is also a parallel to L. Very odd. So here we have two parallel lines passing through a single point so this satisfies the rejection of Playfair's axiom, and it suggests that it's possible to have a geometry where Euclid's fifth postulate fails. Okay, so just to see if you've got a handle on the model, we're going to do a couple checkup exercises uh, regarding this model and regarding the notion of a non-Euclidean geometry. Okay. So here's our first disk model. So first, I'd like you to check that Euclid's first and second postulate hold in this model. So the first and second postulate are true in this model. Uh, when you're checking the second postulate, you will need to modify the notion of length. Uh, if you're going to extend lines indefinitely, 
but you're contained in an open disk, you're going to need to modify the notion of what length is. So think about that, reflect on that um, as you do the first exercise. Okay, then negate Proclus's equivalent of Euclid's fifth postulate. So take the statement of Proclus's equivalent and negate it. And find an example which shows that Proclus' equivalent does not hold in this model. Okay, so play around with the first disk model. Uh, see what you can do in your explorations of non-Euclidean geometry. And uh, we'll follow this up uh, and explore the first disk model in other videos. Thank you very much.